Yeah, it was really good. I mean, I think the other thing, kind of my takeaway was, you know, how important boat handling is at, at all these, you know, events. I mean, being able to, when it's windy like that, uh, you know, tack and jive is obviously always important, but big gains are made in my opinion is, um, this is one thing Andy does really well. And I know I've been working on did really well at this event too, was when you come off the windward mark, kind of that first, especially when there's a little bit of breeze, I don't want to say full plane, but acceleration towards the offset and then getting the boat. So when you get to the offset, you can either turn down if you need to be in a low lane, or if you're going to stay high, have the turn done appropriately so you can protect yourself and kind of extend off the, uh, the jive mark. And you see a lot of folks struggle with getting off that offset and there's a big gain or loss to be made there. Um, and so one of those hot. So run a little hot off the windward mark, and then you gives you the ability to bear off if you want to to the offset, but you don't squeeze yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think there's two there's two things there. Is one is is kind of the arc of the turn, right? As I said, it's not too hard turns; it's like a an arcing turn. But the other thing, it's crucial, and I think um, that that there's a couple things. One, when you bear off at the first mark, people tend to over ease the main sheet. And one of the things is if you, you, yeah, you need to ease so you can bear off, but you, you almost in some ways leave it on a little bit so you can hike against it. The boat bears off and accelerates kind of like, you know, especially if you're a Midwesterner, like ice boats, you know, you're like bearing off and you're not like letting the main out, but you're kind of easing a little bit, but the boat just powers up. Um, that's one of the things. And the other one is once you're kind of settled on that offset leg, you have to pull the board up some so that when you go to the next turn, the boat actually turns down. Whereas if it's, down all the way the boat trips and it's like the turn gets halted and um a lot of people lose a lot of boats and a lot of maybe not a boat right at that mark but you lose a lot of positioning opportunities because then all of a sudden someone turns down inside of you or you turn really too hard and then the guy behind you kind of jumps your breeze and you can't get back to him it's a pretty critical um situation because the reality of this you may not lose them all right then, but the whole plan for the whole leg can get messed up right at that instant. So that sounds like two critical points. Uh, yeah. You see a lot of uh, intermediate sailors, they get to that windward mark and they're kind of like <laughs> made it right and easing and then yeah, know, and it's a drive around the mark, it, keep your speed it, up. Yeah, like I, I the way I look at mark roundings, it's like it's like it's like another start in the race, right? You got to be able to you have to execute that turn perfectly. You could take your break. 30 seconds after the mark if you need to, but you like you can't do it at the mark. It is a critical execution of the turn and getting out of there. It's the same thing at the gate marks. You have to do those, you know, better, especially the first windward mark and the first gate, because the boats are more compressed, right? At the second windward mark, maybe it's not as a big deal, but the first one, especially, you have to make sure you make those those turns correctly. And that's like one of the big differences between a you know, getting a top 10 necessarily or a 25, because if you do it wrong and you have to jive or you get run over, that's the pack that kind of swallows you up. It's that big gains, part. big losses. I, I think big, Absolutely. Gains, big losses yeah. coming into marks and leaving marks. Um, Absolutely. I mean, making that decision when you're on the offset. Yep. You know, am I going to jive, not jive, and not, not sit there confused? Yeah. And usually that decision's made as you're approaching the windward mark, in my opinion. Like you, you kind of know what your game plan is. And then you have to just, I mean, if you think about it, the time from the windward mark to the offset might only be 15 seconds or 20 seconds. You've already hopefully made the decision. Now you just have to execute the turn correctly. Yeah, um, it really seems that there's a, if you had a box around the uh, windward mark and the offset, you yeah. basically say you're in full uh, uh, full contact sports kind of thing coming in around yeah. the mark, around the offset, Yep. Make your decision, choosing your direction, choosing your yep. lane, all that. You're not resting at all until you're after the mark, you're on your line and you know. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. I think that's a critical part of that. Um, yeah. And you saw it, you see it you, quite a bit last weekend because there was more wind, right? So executing that turn and more wind is actually harder. Whereas the lighter air, it's slower. The boat isn't loaded up. You, everybody can kind of do it. But when it's windy or I mean, I wouldn't say it was super windy last week, but it was windy enough that you you have to do it right or it gets tough. So, How much board do you lift? You don't want to lift too much or you could slide. No, I'd probably go halfway up. The, halfway. The, yeah, you know, get a good halfway burp. And then once I'm down and going full downwind, I get the rest of the way up. 
yeah. or switch. To, if you're healing to windward, you switch the boards or do something like that. But you got to get some relief or the boat won't bear off, right? It just right. trips. Yeah. So uh, speaking of the downwind leg, then were there yeah. any big decisions you made on that that those first downwind? Um, I mean, I think I think the yeah, I mean the downwind for me is always a an interesting one in this boat because the angles are pretty low, especially when there's wind. But you have to just identify right away which jibe is the longest um, mm-hmm. and try and get on that as quickly as you can. Um, the other thing that I think is critical, and I've learned quite a bit is these boats don't like to be next to each other. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go fast downwind, you have to find your own space. Um, And even if it means kind of going the wrong way a little bit to get your own space and then be able to go, the boats sail so much better in space. I mean, it's the speed differences are just drastic. So I I think finding your own little piece of land, which isn't always easy, is it's pretty important, I think. Yeah, one of the things that uh, is always in my head, especially in that downwind leg, is never a one-on-one. I always never. try to fight a one-on-one. And some of the junior sailors, people trying to learn, they just get so fixated on that next boat it's, and you, you yeah. can't do that. No, you can't do that. And especially a place like Eustace, you have to remember sometimes you have to give up one to beat 10 or something like that. And it's, you know, it's making the decisions there of what's the most critical, you know, result. I mean, if you look at the, at the results on the, on the, the score sheet there. I mean, the point totals are actually relatively high. So, yeah. you know, it's just getting reasonable scores the whole time. You do pretty well. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was good. And it was, a, it was an interesting regatta because I think all three days were pretty different. So um, yeah. it was good. It was fun. Yeah. Well, it was good to see uh, everybody had some good races and but yeah, you, it was really good. You two yeah. really had some, some awesome races. Yeah, it was fun for sure. So what do you think that uh, Andy did maybe that, edged him further. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think the one thing, if you watch Andy sale, I mean, he gets off the line really well all the time. I mean, it's pretty rare. You see him have a bad start. And the one thing that I think if you look that he does well, and it's time in the boat, obviously, and experience, then if you look at the top boats in that regatta, myself, Matt Fisher, Bill Dreheim, you know, all the, all the top boats, the one thing I think that sets the, boats apart. I don't think it's that they're faster. Like I, like I wouldn't say Andy is faster, but the one thing he doesn't do is he doesn't slow down. Right. So it, it, so the boats end up being quote unquote faster because they don't have the moments where they slow up. They, you know, the top boats kind of just stay at speed all the time and they're not transitioning huge transitions. Like maybe you get a 10th or two knots slow and then you get the speed back up. Whereas someone who's not quite as quick goes down four tenths of a knot and then they have to build their speed back up. And you see that, that the difference is that the slower boats fall back because they slow down and then speed back up and then slow down and speed back up. Whereas the top boats, if you watch, they are at top speed, they slow down a little bit and then they're right back to top speed again. And I think that's kind of the big difference. Um, yeah, it's and a great one point. thing Andy does really well. It's I, I wouldn't say if you line any of us up next to a top, you know, a, a mid fleet boat, are we quote unquote faster? Not necessarily. I think the difference is maintain top speed longer. Right. So, and I, I mean, if you watch Andy sail, I mean, he never slows down ever. I mean, it's remarkable. So it, that's kind of the difference. Yeah. Well, I think, I know he's, uh, he's talked to us before about the way that he anticipates Yep. The, if a lull's coming, he's already setting for the lull before the Absolutely. lull. Absolutely. And when you think about the weight of the hull here, you know, it's a reasonably heavy hull. Absolutely. And it's a heavy boat. Yep. So when you're when you're trying to get it to reaccelerate, you're bleeding off a lot of speed just by yep. spending it on acceleration instead of keeping it. For sure. Yeah. And and the one thing about it is, is it would compared to a, a normal, you know, centerboard or keel boat, the boat accelerates and decelerates pretty drastically. Like mm-hmm. the boat has a big range of speed whereas you know if you're sailing a you know whatever other type of boat you know a keel name boat one, or something name then. one yeah keel boat like if i'm on my j22 or my j70 and you decelerate or accelerate the range of of speed difference is not that big whereas in an mc also you get a puff you could be going a knot faster than somebody else or so it, it it's maintaining those speeds i think is the difference between a top top boat and a you know yeah. an average boat you know what i mean 
I think that's. I, I'd also say advantage. that uh, there's a certain piece of what you guys in the top ten do. Yeah, it isn't a. There's no recipe for that that I can tell somebody. It's stick time. It's just the feel yeah. of the boat. It's just yeah. that. Yeah, and, and I think it's understanding. You know, I, I think it can get overwhelming of all the things you can do to make the boat go, and kind of picking and choosing your battles. I think is a is a critical one. And, you know, kind of you can't adjust the main sheet, the traveler, the back, uh, the backstay, the out hall, you know, the, all these things. You can't do it at once. You only have two hands. Right. One of them's on the tiller. So you only have one other hand. So yeah. kind of coming up with your own system of how you're going to manage that is it's a little bit personalized. Right. How I do it and how you do it and how Andy does it and how Bill Drahan does it. Everybody does it might be different, but they're all trying to do the same thing. Right. Which is keep the boat on its feet, keep the boat on its heel angle keep the boat at speed and you know it's some of it may be sail dependent some of it may be tuning dependent it doesn't really matter but it's having your own system of how you're going to manage it and i think that's you know you can't just pull everything and ease everything at the same time it's impossible right right um yeah i, I agree with you um yeah. one of the things that was interesting trying to analyze because I'm always watching these Melgus guys who seem to have been born with yep. a tiller in their hand you know yep and and the whole uh sheet tiller thing yeah if they're going to point up they're already pulling their sail in so their hands are moving simultaneously wow. yeah clear down sail in mm -hmm. sail out you know if yeah. you're off right their right. the tiller's coming up but they're they're right. easing that sheet right. they're not lagging they're not going i'm going to bear off oh i need to ease my sheet and that is a learned behavior of yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a, a muscle memory, right? I mean, it's it's like one of these things you can think about just as you're watching yourself, your hands are moving in opposite directions, right? right. I mean, you never see someone trying to, you know, if you're headed up, if you're heading up, you're pushing, right? So mm -hmm. you never get to see a main sheet is and heading up at the same right. time or a bear off trimming the main end. I mean, it's, and you see sometimes people are like, well, it, it doesn't work. If you're pulling the tiller and the main sheet at the same time, the boat's not going to do what you want it to do. So, right it is a little bit of a give and take and understanding that and, and figuring it out for sure. But, yeah. um, so what yeah, did you see other people doing where you said, you know, hmm, you should have done this or you could have done that or. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the biggest thing, you know, kind of my takeaway from watching, you know, what other people are doing, I think it's the big one to me is still the starting situation. Cause it seems like everyone just clumps up at the, the boat end and kind of just goes I don't know why it makes everyone feel comfortable, but I, you know, to me, it's a getting space and just sailing your own race is more important than being all clumped up there. I think that's one. Um, I think the second one is as it gets breezier, you know, finding ways to depower the boat and, you know, just pulling the controls on and doing things. I mean, you, you see a lot of boats out there, they're under vanged and they're under outhauled and under Cunningham all the time. And, you know, you, you talk to any of the top guys, I mean, I think it was day, I'm trying to refresh my memory. Day two was pretty breezy, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look, everything's on almost as hard as they can pull it. And and you, then you see, you know, boats in the middle or the back that are struggling and everything's off. And then they're like, oh, couldn't keep the boat from tipping over. It's like, well, you got to pull the vang on. You got to pull the alcohol on. So I think a little bit of it is some of just the basic, you know, keeping your controls in line. And, and um, you know, and I think some of it too is, is a little bit of a, a um, you know, not being afraid to, you know, try things. And, you know, the one thing about the boat is it tells you when it's unhappy pretty quick, right? I mean, if a puff hits and it's rounding up or, if, you know, the boat is overpowered, it's tipping over. I mean, it's telling you it's not right. So, right. I mean, I, I think that the real issue is just taking the diagnosis and trying to figure out how to help it out. And it could be, maybe there's nothing you can do and you've already done everything you can do, but I think doing nothing is kind of not, necessarily right either right there's a lot of experimentation and figuring it out so i see so many people like hanging on for dear life on their yeah. ear like this and yeah. I, i'm thinking okay well it's like uh hitting the gas in your car and spinning your tires yeah. you clearly have more power than the boat's able to accelerate into it would yeah. be better if you had depowered before you hit the puff yeah. but ease your sail Ease you know, your sail as hard as you can, but ease your damn sail. Either ease a sail, you know, <laughs> let the boat round up a little bit and flatten out yeah. something like like pulling the tiller to your ear and having the boat skid sideways doesn't do anything. So, right. it, yeah, there definitely is um, a part of that for sure. Yeah, an interesting behavior. Yeah, the starts. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of times try people think, okay, this is the favorite end. I've got to be right at the favorite end. Sometimes the favorite end is the next spot down that's open. You know? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, my number one thing is, you know, the favorite half is what I call it. And then finding the most low density place I can find because nothing worse than being stuck between two boats. You just got to be able to go and just yeah. do your thing. So, you know, if, if you give up, you know, 10 spots on the line to have room, it's totally worth it. Right. I mean, and, being, being, worth it. and being on the front line. Yeah, you got absolutely. Yeah, sure. You have to. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. Being yep. in the second row or even being, you know, slightly behind the boat to windward. Brutal. It's going to, you know, it's exponential yeah. how far back. And, and, and the problem, you know, is in for a lot of scout racing, it's lake sailing, right? So it's usually pretty there's usually pretty big shifts. So you either got to be on one tack or the other pretty quickly. Right. So if you're not in the front group and can't do that, it's really tough. Cause then you're sailing in bad air on the wrong tack and all of a sudden, you know, you're in the back half of the fleet right away. And it's a tough road to go from that. Yeah. You know, from that position. So. Um, uh, yeah. Really good. Uh, interesting insights from that race. Um, can you tell us, uh, is there anything else that you think about the series in general where you felt like, where did anybody ever come up to you and say, hey, I'm trying to figure out X, Y, Z. Is there anything that you could pass forward? Um, you know, I think the only thing that, you know, most people I think were just asking was more about, you know, how critical, you know, the board angles are, which which I kind of think it is and, you know, kind of in your all purpose setting, knowing where max down is and, and just not being afraid that when you start getting overpowered or it's getting windier to pull the board up, you know, right. that little bit just to, you know, you, you can almost sit there, hold the tiller sail, slowly pull the board line up and you can feel the boat just go. And that's kind of your, your free spot. And I think a lot of folks, you know, resistance. I know when I started sailing MC, I was very resistant to doing it. Yeah. Um, and uh, it made a huge difference. Um, I mean, it was interesting right before the inlands in Okaboji, whatever that was a year and a half ago, two years ago now, um, we did a good tr big training session with um, you know, Chris and Al and we had JP coaching us and all everything was great. And, you know, we were there and we're going up window. And I was like, man, I feel pretty good. JP was like, you've got to pull the board up. And I'm like, you're nuts. And he's like, I'm telling you, I could see the wake on your rudder. The boat's not going as fast as you can go. You've got to pull the board up. And I like resisted, resisted, resisted. He's like, just do it, try it. And if it doesn't work, you can go back. It's a practice session, but just trust me on this. You got to do it. And we're going up wind and I'm all lined up and I feel like I'm going pretty good. He's like, do it. And I pulled the board up and the boat instantly just was like, it was a different boat. Yeah. So, I, I mean, to me, I think that is the biggest on days like we had to use this, just getting the board up a little bit. It's not a lot. I mean, we're talking half an inch, inch max. It makes all the difference. All and indicator one is you have excessive windward helm. Helm, helm is all. Yeah. Yep. As soon as the helm goes away, you're you're good to go. Yes. Just slightly, slightly more than neutral. So you're basically yep. right. You mm -hmm. want a little windward helm, but not much. Just enough exactly. to know your feel. But, yep. Yep. Yeah. Just enough that feel, but you know enough to make it go away. Yep. Yeah. Good point. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for all those insights. Yeah. Uh, no problem.